and uh, welcome back and we are of course uh, very happy to have you here with us this morning tell you what's coming up uh, we'll be talking of course after yesterday's uh, statistics essay uh, figures release and also looking at what GDP is doing the contraction of uh, 51 percent in our economy we're going to talk about how to perhaps get us back working as a nation because that has to be our primary focus right now Leanne uh, you know you were talking earlier about perhaps getting the president to talk to us and talk about opening up mm -hmm. of our borders and the economy needs to get back on track we were struggling before COVID-19 I don't know maybe this presents an opportunity for us to do things differently and really have a go at restructuring our economy. Yeah, it's certainly. I mean, look, these, these things are very important that when you find yourselves in these difficult situations like we have when it's come to coronavirus, things need to change. We need to find new avenues and new ways of creating business opportunities, finding new avenues, and that's the reality, and this is what we do need. But we'll hopefully get a little bit more insight into what government has planned. But, you know, I've often sat down and thought about it myself, those kind of things that, uh, that li where life has changed in this, in this uh, pandemic. And, you know, what is it that you would like to see stay forever in terms of the change that you've seen? Uh, there's a couple of things. I mean, I think the working environment for a lot of corporates Many are finding it very, very nice working from home. I mean, I'm taking a different trajectory here on what we were saying, but just in general, where we say things need to change because it's happened, we've managed to do it. I think a lot of corporates are saying, you know, I like this working from home. I'm finding I'm being more productive. It's taken a lot of stress out of my lives. The traffic is not as bad. So I'm wondering if that's one thing that's gonna change. On a personal note, I've noticed with my kids, I'm loving their shorter days because they're not having as long a days as they did before. They are finishing earlier, having more time to themselves. And this has all been brought on by a pandemic. Is there anything else that you've kind of felt that you hope stays after this? It's an interesting one because in as much as it may work for the companies, the corporates, as you say, having people work from home, that sort of dynamic doesn't work for everybody. Yeah. Some people find it very hard to be productive while they're at home. So, you know, there, there, there are all of these different dynamics at play and, and they need to be thought through and um, I suppose uh, try and find the best solutions for everybody. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. uh, they, as you say, tell us what you think uh, should stay from some of the changes that we've seen that have been brought about as a result of COVID-19. Um, I'm just reminded by some story that I think it was my Amaya Ketla Motlabe did at a taxi rank in Joburg at the beginning of the pandemic where people were being told to wash their hands and sanitize. And he was interviewing this woman and she asked, so what have people been doing? Yes. Haven't you been washing your hands <laughs> exactly. all along? You know, things like That's that. That's got to stay. The, the hand well, we washing. Hope. We hope. I hope so because we you hope. and I were chatting and saying it's already starting to take a dip. We're seeing some people are getting a little bit sort of uh, sloppy. You know what I love is, yeah. and, and, and I saw somebody doing it, to, they actually did it to me the other day at the queue. You know the usual queue, that social distancing, where somebody comes up right against you and they're like, and I'm standing there, I'm like, I, I, I so badly want to tell you, please just step back. Not even because of social distancing, just in general. You know that, you know that when they're breathing down Personal your neck? space. Can't stand it. But the lady behind the counter said to him, hey, hey, step back, step back, social distancing. Love that. So let's hope that stays. <laughs> that was a good thing. All right. Oh, and, 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 and as you say, you see, um, you, you can already see how we are creeping back and yes. reverting to some of our old habits. And, and, and this is what we need to guard against right now. But there are so many interesting conversations to be had around these things. But I think most urgent has to be, how do we get the economy back on track? Mm. Um, you know, when I was listening to um, uh, the first news bulletin, uh, where you were talking about what the president was saying yeah. and talking about uh, job opportunities. You see, it, it's that sort of language that just makes me uncomfortable mm, once again mm. because we've heard about these things before. And and and, and what point do we get to um, say we are creating real sustainable jobs, creating conducive environments for business to flourish in? And what does that mean? Mm -hmm. and, and, and what does it require from both sides? So 
one thing we are all agreed upon, and we've seen this happen in various parts of the world, is that infrastructure development is a key, key driver of economic uh, growth and recovery. So it's Leanne, so that's your next uh, conversation with uh, Dr. Khosi and Ramakopa. Yeah, it already. is. So good, good introduction into that. So let's, uh, let's, let's pick that up. So as, as Sakini was just saying, South Africa really does need urgent economic recovery strategies to save this country from a fiscal cliff. Uh, economists have been estimating a decline of up to 60% on the country's gross domestic product or GDP, but the 51% contraction reported by Statistics SA yesterday, it really did still come as a jolt. Uh, despite the fact that the South African economy has been shrinking over the years, including four consecutive contractions recently, a crippling decline of this magnitude was last seen in 1993-94. With the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, the country needs a clear plan to bring a necessary turnaround strategy into play. Will President Cyril Ramaphosa's infrastructure investment package worth 2.3 trillion rand over the next 10 years be the answer to some of the damage caused to the economy? Well, to discuss this, we joined by the former Gauteng MEC for Economic Development, who is now the head of the Investment and Infrastructure Office in the Presidency, Dr. Jose Enzo Ramachopa. Great to have you. Thank you so much for being with us on the program. Morning, Lian. Uh, thank you for the invitation and morning to, to the viewers of Morning Life. So given those second quarter GDP results, which really were not good at all, but not unexpected. This is, this is expected after uh, seeing what South Africa and the world has been going through during this pandemic. What do you believe is the best way to get the South African economy onto a recovery path? Well, I think you're absolutely correct, uh, Lee, and I think uh, it was not to be anticipated. I mean, you could see the trend line. I think you you make a correct observation that is uh, four consecutive uh, quarters of negative growth. So what the pandemic has done was to accentuate a, 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 an already dire situation. So our problems and economic woes are not as a result of the pandemic, but the pandemic has only served to, to accentuate that. Let, let me make the point that you are going to need the multiple interventions, pillars, if you like, uh, to, to drive the economy out of this uh, difficult situation. And you also make a, a, a correct observation that there are lessons uh, from history that demonstrate that an aggressive uh, public sector-led build program is going to be key in, uh, in the recovery effort. And that explains the work that we have been doing uh, for, the, for the past six months or so. Um, and I think that uh, major features of that work, the first one is uh, the, the, the degree of the collaboration between the public and private sector, because I think this is going to be a South African effort. So the expectation should not be that it's just the state that is going to, um, to, to help us to come out of this difficult situation. It has to be a collective effort. And hence the conversations that are happening in the in network with the social partners to ensure that uh, essentially you you are able to construct a south african response to the problem that is confronting us obviously the state must be must be at the forefront um, and then the, the second feature is uh, the extent to which you are able to draw participation from the private sector to fund some of the infrastructure build programs so we know that the fiscal matrix has uh, has deteriorated uh, so you are projected the uh, revenue the recovery there i mean the commissioner from uh, uh, SARS has been saying that uh, the projections are that there's going to be up to 300 billion rands uh, uh, under collection. The debt to GDP continues to, to rise. So, and then the third thing is that uh, as a result, we know that the fiscal headspace has, uh, has um, significantly been uh, uh, dissipated. So it doesn't exist, the fiscal headspace. So you, you, you can look at the fiscals, the national pass to fund some of this uh, um, aggressive program. So there's a need for, for you to formulate the interventions that allow private sector participation. And that's work that we've been doing for the past uh, six months. And then the third one is that you are going to need uh, significant reforms, uh, um, uh, Lien, uh, to ensure that uh, you, you are going to facilitate facilitate uh, this uh, this recovery effort i mean from the funding perspective the triple p environment has to be reformed to ensure that we we allow for the speedy conclusion of um, 
of triple P, I'm talking about public-private uh, partnership as a funding mechanism. And we know that now it only accounts for about 2% of all infrastructure spending, when in fact in other parts of the world is significantly higher. So, and the result is because uh, that is as a result of uh, um, a, a space, uh, if you like, the legislative framework uh, that does not uh, uh, allow for, for, for that ease of participation in the in the triple P space. And then yeah, the fourth yeah. area, Leanne, is that you, you need to introduce new funding instruments. Like I said, that the fiscal headspace has, uh, has diminished. So you need to be introducing, as we are proposing issues like uh, project bonds, we need to go into uh, introducing green infrastructure bonds. We know that uh, Germany has introduced one, which was uh, oversubscribed just recently. And uh, that's uh, in some instances is concessionary funding is cheap uh, money. There's big pool of liquidity. Obviously, we're not the only ones competing for it, but we need to be designing projects in that way. And then the fifth one is that you need to address uh, malfeasance and leakage. So you can come with, uh, obviously, the first phase of what we have uh, announced is about 230 billion rands of this uh, uh, investments. And I'm confident that in the next six months, we are coming with uh, the next phase, which could be significantly bigger than the 340 billion. Remember that a lot of this money is the one that comes from the private sector. The state simply facilitates through some degree of reform, unblocking and unlocking the participation of the private private sector. Mm, so mm. we need to be able to account for, for that money. Yeah, uh, otherwise, if there's the case, there's malfeasance, is going to undermine the, the recovery effort. Uh, like you say, I mean, although there were projections about, as we put it, up to 65%, I'm just saying just the sheer scale that now we're confronted with a 51% contraction, I think we, we should be worried and seriously worried. I mean, uh, I can't uh, fathom the, the employment numbers when they come, you know, they lag. I'm, I'm sure that they, they are going to be uh, significantly dire. So essentially, you, you, are, you are confronted with a, with a crisis and the response must be commensurate to the scale of the problem. So there must be a degree of appreciation that you are confronted with a crisis. There must be some agency who must be a bit aggressive, who must be innovative. Like I said, it must be a South African effort. That's where we are. So I guess this is the, the turning point is the lowest moment. I think we, we must use this to galvanize, uh, I guess, all the social partners. And I'm very confident that when President Ramaphosa comes out of uh, of with a plan that has been sufficiently canvassed, uh, that is going to to make a dent. Okay. Well, I think you've given us quite a um, a comprehensive look into what some of the plans are and and how you plan on doing this. But you know, on paper uh, things sound good, but in reality it never works out that way. And that's one of the big problems. Is that as you yeah. yourself have mentioned, those unemployment figures are going to come through, and this is where we're really going to understand how dire this has been. I mean, this economy has been on a rocky path, and. This is precisely why the president actually created this position in the presidency. So, I mean, what are the, the concrete things that we can actually understand? I mean, are we going to be building factories? Are we going to be trying to create our own manufacturing where we're going to see thousands of people employed, people going in, creating South African-made things, investing in South African products and allowing these things to flourish. I mean, put it to us in a simple way, because people that are watching yes. right now don't understand the highfalutin economic talk. Let's talk to them. What exactly are you doing? Like your first plan, what are you doing? What are you going to open to make jobs for people? You know, it's a fair comment, uh, Lee, and I think I agree with you that uh, we mustn't speak in high boardroom uh, speak, uh, as you put it, convoluted language. So if you look at the, the numbers, if you were to dissect them, you can see that uh, there's contraction across the economy. So in some instances, when we have a quarter con con contraction, we can see that there's this and that sector that is responsible for the con contraction. In these instances, across the economy, except agriculture. So if you look at the economic value chain, there's a primary production where you extract raw material, if you like. So in that instance, you have mining, you have agriculture in the main. Like I said, agriculture has seen uh, some degree of uh, increase, but mining uh, has been on the decline. And I guess that can be explained by the fact that um, we we have had uh, a hard lockdown. Obviously, this accounts primarily for that 
primarily for that period of the lockdown. And that's why I said earlier on that it was not to be anticipated, but it's just the sheer scale. Mm. So there was uh, essentially no mining. So if you go down the value chain after you extract these uh, um, minerals, then uh, you are beginning to beneficiate them. And that's where you have what you call the secondary sector that is manufacturing. So you are beginning to, to produce uh, goods um, uh, that can be used and consumed in the economy. And then much la later they get to, to be consumed. You get enter into the, 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 the tertiary sector, uh, if you like. So you're talking trade, uh, you, you're talking the, the financial the financial sector. If you look at the, 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 the trend line of the economy or the degree of the mutation of the South African economy is that there's been high levels of uh, deindustrialization. So the manufacturing base has been contracting. Uh, there's been um, high levels of uh, tertiarization. So the key sectors that have been driving this economy post 1994 uh, is what we call the tertiary sectors, financial sector. And the financial sector does not absorb the supply side. So it doesn't necessarily create the kind of numbers that are required for you to be able to employ people. And if it does, it requires higher skills. So the, the levels of entry or the entry barriers are significantly higher when we know that the critical mass of our people are, are, are unskilled or have a semi-skilled. So you need to design uh, interventions that allows you to attract that uh, supply side. Yeah, so yeah. what are we seeing? So yeah. one of the issues that the president has raised is that what the build program must do is that um, um, as, uh, as you drive this infrastructure effort, you must ensure that uh, there's localization. So localization simply means that the, the inputs that are required for you to be able to build this infrastructure program must be uh, manufactured uh, in the country and how you do it you need some reforms in some instances the state must be very aggressive to say there must be designations designation simply says that this input material that goes into building the roads and uh, that goes into building the dams and into manufacturing panels for power have to manu be manufactured in the country you don't have to to be importing them from Southeast Asia. We know that the, uh, the, the, the concrete sector, the steel sector is facing competition of cheap imports that are coming into the country. Yeah. So you need to protect this economy because that's where you are going to create the jobs. So I can talk about this 340 billion rent as the first phase of the aggressive infrastructure program. You can see the roads being built, but you have to ask a very pertinent question. Where are the inputs materials coming from? Because you need to be creating this employment upstream of uh, this construction exercise. Yeah. So as we see people on the construction side doing the jobs, we are happy those are the direct jobs. And there's what we call the indirect jobs. The jobs that comes as a result of this build program are going to be created in the manufacturing sector. What must be done for this, for us to be able to manufacture, we must stop these cheap imports that are coming, protect your local manufacturing base, ensure that there's a greater levels of participation, open it up some degree of uh, the democratization, allow for new players, black players to play in there. If they were to play in that space, they need the yeah. offtake. Someone needs to buy from them. Yeah? And Indeed. for you to ensure that someone buys from them, you must compel those that are project sponsors, our SOEs that will be rolling out this project to say you are not going to import, you have to buy locally. And over a period of time, improve their skills, we improve competitiveness. So if we become more competitive, more efficient, you find that the, the, the cost of producing is lower. So you are not just looking at the domestic market. You are not only supplying for these projects that we have announced and future projects that we are announcing in the country mm -hmm. you are now mm -hmm. able to go into the african market so mm -hmm. suddenly your market is not the domestic market it's not just the 54.9 billion million people rather in the country is the one billion plus people on the continent yeah, and yeah. once that is the size of the market so it means that you need to produce more as you need to produce more because the demand is higher then you need to um um, um uh, create more jobs because Indeed. you must say uh, everything you're saying it's amazing i mean everything you're saying Unfortunately, we have heard before, and depending on the private sector is something that, that I think a lot of people are taking issue with as well, is that we can't necessarily be depending too much on the private sector. And, and government have 
constantly been promising this over and over again, but it's the results that we're failing to see, and that's a big problem. I mean, the other factors that continue to undermine economic effectiveness, such as um, the, the incompetency of those deployed to roll out policy and government projects, it's a huge problem, which results in, in a wastage of money, including recent cases related to infrastructure. I mean, we look at something like the, the Tembisa School Project, which was built on a, on a wetland, which basically wasted 80 million rand and the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure a project that Parliament says is wastage and fruitless expenditure. I mean, is the government ready to look into skills and capability of people, put the right people in the jobs, and allow them to do it without interfering? Because this is the problem. Unabated corruption is undermining South Africa. Yes, I think I, I agree with you there, Leanne, Leanne. So I have no defense. I, I won't venture into any form of defense. So one of the things that we have mapped, so as you, you introduce this build program, you need to identify where are the risks li likely going to come from. And it's exactly that, is the capacity of the state to discharge uh, its responsibilities. And I'm talking about the technical and financial engineering skills. There are other areas of uh, state capacity where the state is significantly stronger. Uh, policy making, I think the, st the state is significantly stronger, I'm sorry, but we have reached the stage, as we say, for us to be able to get into a mode of uh, being action orientated and ensuring that we are beginning to build that state capacity. If you remember, the, the president keeps on saying, even during the state of uh, the nation address, uh, the inaugural address of the sixth administration, he identified seven priorities and he goes further to say, in fact, the first priority is about building state capacity. So getting the right skills. And I'm talking in this instance, the engineering and the, the engineering, the, the, the technical and financial engineering skills, the degree to which you are able to package projects and you are able to, to deliver them. That's the first part. The second part is a, a risk that we have identified. I had said it before, Lian, is malfeasance, leakage and, and corruption that can bedevil the work that we are doing. Uh, so essentially, you are not getting the necessary returns. The money is misdirected, is misallocated, or is misspent. So it is important that you are able to implement consequent management. And the, I, I think various ministers have been on public platform indicating the work that we, we are, the state is doing to ensure that there's consequent management. The um, parliament is o on overdrive with regards to oversight, how we've been able to unearth, mm -hmm. if you like, a school that has been built on a wetland, how we've been able to and earth uh, the fence that uh, is uh, the bait bridge fence, the border fence, is that parliament uh, is, uh, is observing this with hawk eyes, they go on site. So it's uh, some degree of activism from the legislatures to ensure that there's degree of oversight. So it mustn't end there. There has to be consequent management. And then we must see the results. So you must see that the state is acting. Those that are found at fault, in fact, they, they must fall on their sword. So once you begin to see that, I think it's going to breed confidence. And I take the criticism, by the way. I think you are right. For as long as people, I'm talking about the uh, uh, citizens, are not beginning to see this, we are coming across as not being believable. So I guess in this instance, and we don't have an option. You make a valid point that but the host, these things have been said before. They, yes, it's true that they could have been said before, but now you are sitting with a situation where the economy is um, in, a, in a significant distress. I mean, 51% yeah, yeah. quarter contraction uh, is, uh, is significant by any measure. I had said that even at the current levels of unemployment, the last day, the, uh, the quarterly labor survey was sitting at 30%, the narrow definition, and I'm sure the expanded definition is significantly higher, and it's young people um, and, and women that are at the receiving end. So you are, you are, you are getting into what I call a perfect storm that can undermine, if you like, the stability of the country. So you need to be respond to be responding in the most aggressive fashion. It has to be urgent, the yeah. manner of the response. Well, it, it must be communicated with agree. the scale. I do the agree with you. It does need to be urgent. And, 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 and I think South Africans want to believe that we will see something coming out of this 2.3 million or billion, not even million, billion rand. But it is just very difficult. And one can only imagine that South Africans do find it difficult to believe this because you talk about the perfect storm, you talk about this is a do or die. We were in a pandemic and there was looting and corruption around PPE that was there to save South Africans' lives and to protect people. And yet there was rampant corruption happening there. And this is the problem, is that the trust of South Africans 
is slowly eroding if it hasn't eroded already. So this is up to you and your team and the rest of everybody else to prove that this can be done. Yes. It's a lot of money and with a lot of money comes a lot of corruption. Yes, absolutely. And that's why we have identified the risk. And just Lian, to make the point that our view that the state must lead, but I think it's a, there has to be a South African effort. And I'm confident with some of the conversations that are happening, obviously, the president will, will make that there public with the social partners at Night Lake. There's right. that there appreciation that something needs to be done. More agent, we must be bold, we must be aggressive. This is where we are. Let's, I think we'll use this as a turning point. I'm more than confident. Lian. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thanks very, very much for talking to us, Dr. Josienzo Ramachopa, who is the head of the President's uh, Investment and Infrastructure Office, talking to us about that second quarter GDP result, as well as the best way to get the South African economy on that investment path. And remember, that 2.3 trillion rand investment, that infrastructure investment that was announced by the President, that they say, hoping to create jobs and develop infrastructure in the country. All right, just gone seven. Let's get our news, Sakina.